My name is Greg Rupik, a contributing editor of With One Accord, and I'm pleased to welcome Professor Hanna-Barbera Gelfalkowitz to a conversation today. Um, Professor Gelfalkowitz, you are a philosopher and theologian who has published in the fields of cultural anthropology, feminism and gender, philosophy of religion, uh, as well as philosophy of the 19th and 20th centuries, and uh, in a branch of philosophy known as phenomenology. Your scholarship includes a special focus on theologian Romano Guardini. And on today's, and for today's subject of discussion on being, we're focusing on Edith Steins or St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, as others might know her. Uh, for the last 12 years, you've been head of the Institute for European Philosophy and Religion at the Hochschule Benedikt Sechsenta in Heiligenkreuz, Vienna, Austria. And most recently, you were awarded the 2021 Ratzinger Prize for theology presented by Pope Francis in Rome. And I believe on that occasion, you also personally met with Pope Benedict XVI. So congratulations. So we'll jump right into speaking about Edith Stein then. Um, Edith Stein studied the kind of many faceted concepts of being in her research, uh, as well as her own lived experience. So could you briefly outline what these would be uh, as you introduce us to Edith Stein, her life and her work? Yeah, let's start with the idea um, and the question whether she is um, one of the first rank women philosophers. Edith Stein is the first woman assistant of philosophy in Germany, the first woman assistant or female hmm. assistant in philosophy. Uh, she studied um, philosophy, what is in itself remarkable because uh, philosophy, of course, was a so-called study without bread and butter. How could one earn money with that? But she was confidential to, her, to find a place and indeed she did it. And her mother who was taking care of this youngest and most beloved girl was always a bit in, in, in sorrow, was questioning whether just this daughter would find a place in life because she has no normal, no normal um, study and no normal um, belonging to some office or something like that. But also the mother somehow understood that his youngest and, and most gifted daughter was able to find her way in life. And that is in the, indeed um, a kind of self, um, yeah, self estimation, self estimate, something what Edith Stein always felt that she was specially gifted, specially, specially even um, yeah, prepared to open questions in philosophy and to deal with that. Are you, can you tell us about some of those facets of philosophy that she began to study uh, after that preparation? Yeah, she studied, of course, phenomenology, what is uh, the, the field of studies of Husserl. And of course, later on with Heidegger, Heidegger was a companion of her. Heidegger was a com combatant, one can say, and they developed a bit in the same direction. I can speak about that a bit later. Uh, they both went from phenomenology to ontology. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I will explain it a bit later because it is a specific problem. But um, she, in this circle of Husserl, was always called the so-called master disciple, the master student, because she was able to, to rethink um, Husserl's very complicated ideas. And we um, are glad to have three, three books of Husserl three books of Husserl um, that she uh, actually finished while Husserl had only um, brought a few papers and a few uh, concepts, but did not find an end for that. And Edith Stein in her vacances, in her, in her open times, in her left times, she then started writing about it and made actually completed, completed these three books of Husserl. We are very glad to have that, but it shows the rank, the rank of her philosophical um, um, yeah, the writing that Husserl mm -hmm. trusted her. He trusted her very deeply. And in the same way, he was uh, astonished about her convers conversion later on, because he had thought that she was like he himself, in a way, um, abstaining from uh, religious uh, matters and religious questions. And in this way, it was a bit 
one can even say disappointed by her because she left his way of this um, yeah, distant and abstract thinking and devoting herself then indeed to a belief that for him was a very strange thing. Could you say a little bit about, like, as, as she began to kind of advance in the field of philosophy, she wrote this work a little bit later in her career, I believe, Finite and Eternal Being. Um, I wonder whether you could tell us roughly what that was about, what her main points are, her arguments are in Finite and Eternal Being. Yeah. In this, um, in this master work of her, it was written in 1936, 1937. She was already uh, Sister Theresia Benedicta of the Cross in the Carmel of Cologne. So she had no library in the background. She had a few books only. And if we read this book, we are astonished today. Uh, she, she actually did not use any footnotes. She has very few remarks on different authors. There are some, but not many. And it shows indeed also the style, the type of her writing, that was, by the way, common for many pupils of uh, Husserl. She called it all, always, and from the very beginning, one had to make one's organs of thinking, one's, um, one's, one's tools of thinking, just oneself. And she was proud of that, and she also used it. And even as a nun, and, and without any library in the background, she was able to write um, really 400, 500 pages um, of the following content. Her problem was that the finite, the finite being actually is, of course, a mortal one, vanishing, not stable. But the question was whether this ending in death, ending in, in, a, yeah, in vanity, is actually the end of life in itself. And she was asking whether we were living just to die. Hmm. This is in a way senseless. It is a senseless, uh, senseless uh, idea. And that was the beginning of her uh, scrutinizing. Are there indexes in our life? Are there hints and um, a few even colors in our life that can send us to that what we call the sense of life? Sense hmm. means direction, yeah? And that is the, the leading idea of this book. So the, uh, how does her lived experience kind of uh, inform that work and all of her philosophy? You mentioned already that, and I, not many, not everyone understands or knows that, you know, Edith Stein was a convert to Catholicism, that she was, you know, at one time an atheist, um, that she uh, recognized later in her life her own Jewish identity uh, and her history, um, and that eventually she would be martyred for the faith that she held so dear. Um, can you explain or speak about how her lived experiences as a convert, uh, as a Jewish person, as a woman, informed her philosophy? Um, we had the World War, the First World War, uh, between 1914 to 1918, as we know. And uh, after that, there was a collapse of the normal European world as we knew it up to that date. And also Edith Stein speaks about a catastrophe of this world war. After that, in Germany, things were changing very hardly. The Protestant church in Germany had lost the leading role. The Protestant emperor, Wilhelm, fled to the Netherlands and the, the idea of of being um, a monarchy uh, died. Hundreds of intellectuals converted to Catholic faith. It was a kind of change, uh, of complete change of the, of the making of um, national character. The national character was Protestant, but at that time, the Catholic church uh, seemed to be an anchor, an anchor just by its over nationality. It was not confined to a specific nation. Mm -hmm. The same happened, by the way, by the flight of many Russian intellectuals after 1917, and they brought the Orthodox Church, the idea of the, um, of the eternal Orthodox Church also to Germany. So we had, um, in a way, quite suddenly, two very old and much older than Protestantism, two old churches 
uh, in a way in a, that was unknown to many people. And many, many uh, students of Husserl converted to Catholic faith, even many Jews in Husserl's circle. And he was even appalled by that. We know about this letter to Roman Ingarden, one of his uh, pupils, who said, uh, where he wrote that it is a misery in the souls and even Edith Stein, whom he appreciated so highly, uh -huh. evidently changes faith and he cannot understand this youth. Uh -huh. So this conversion was in a way not, um, not a specific, it was specific of course for every con convert, it is a specific one. But Edith Stein was also in a stream of conversion, in a real stream, in a real, I, um, we would call it yeah a cultural cultural change even. So her own, so her her conversion to Catholicism seems to have been part of a, as you say, kind of a stream, a historical moment when Catholicism was kind of in 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 some ways very attractive and resurgent uh, in Europe. Um, does her experience as a woman in philosophy, as a woman in general, uh, or as a Catholic within those circles, change the way that she does philosophy and change the way how she understands being. Yeah, yeah, I think she that has an influence. Being Catholic um, meant for her to enter in a universal world what was close to her up to that date. She had entered the universal world of philosophy, of course, but she did not know the universal world of the, uh, by the way, neither the Old, Old Testament nor the New Testament. She was Jewish by birth and Jewish, of course, by bringing up and she, know all, she knew all the festivals of her family and so, et cetera, et cetera. But in school, she did not visit the, study of religion, what was offered by the rabbi. She did not want it, she, did, she wasn't interested in, in the age of eight, or 14 years, she decided not to pray any longer. Hmm. She regarded herself to be a radical non-believer, radical non-believer. She didn't ever use the word atheist, but an radical non-believer. Hmm. And when she went into philosophy, just to Husserl, she discovered that philosophy was so, so close, so indeed so, um, so in the neighborhood of theology, actually up to the um, to the 18th century, philosophers and theologians were always in the same in the same room. You can read Saint Augustine as a philosopher. You can read him as a uh -huh. theologian. You can read Platon. Platon was one of the favorite um, philosophers of Husserl, and you can read absolutely as a theologian. He writes about about the sacred and so and so on. And Edith Stein discovered to her own um, strange uh, discovery that she was just moving in a room that she had never wanted to, to enter. Mm. And in this way she worked. And then she studied, of course, um, the, um, the field of truth as the main field of philosophy. Mm -hmm. It was for her the eye opening for a truth that goes beyond experience, just beyond only natural sciences just beyond the logic of our, of our being and opens a way to transcendence. And this entering into transcendence opened her eyes then for authors what she would never have had read before. Thomas Aquinas, for instance, also Augustine was not on her, was not on, on her side. And she discovered that these people, also the church fathers, were in a way this, um, so close to the, the discussion of truth and truth not only as a objective um, problem, but truth uh, as leading to a person and to a personal understanding. Truth was for her the word for getting into a relation, not only to things, not only to logic, but truth was a relation to a personal acquaintance with the holy one, that was already the very end. But truth was the, the kind of, yeah, one can say a kind of, yeah, uh, open, an open way to something what she never had expected to find. The relationship to truth as a person, that was something what was absolutely astonishing for her. And she found it also already in the church fathers. 
truth not only as something what is written in books, what can be a, an object of thinking, but truth as a living person. And for her, that was the discovery of her life. So this idea of truth as relationship between the person, the inquirer, the philosopher, and this kind of ultimate reality or this transcendent reality. And you're saying that she's already starting to identify in people like the church fathers and Aquinas and the like that this ultimate reality has this personal element. And so that's how she kind of uh, connects the philosophical with kind of the natural theological or the theological realm, is that right? Yeah, in a very early work of hers, um, where she writes about the sociological problems of uh, thinking, also the, the interrelational um, combinations, when we are thinking, we are not thinking alone, we are thinking in a society, we are thinking in a, in a context with other persons. She writes a very strange passage, um, we cannot really fix it in her life, but she writes about it without being very personal. And she says that uh, she had, the, or not she, somebody had the experience that he lost trust in reality. Um, it, is a, it is an anonymous what she write about, but we, we think and we are, have any reasons to say that she's, it is herself. What is reality? And she writes about that this person was in a state of, of as well suffocating, but also um, yeah, diving in the water and being drowned more or less. Mm. And then there was a hand or an arm that took this person out and, she, and the person found itself back into a room where it was warm, warm and people taking, taking care of it and so on. And, she does not say that it is she herself, but everything shows to that. And she understood that thinking as a pure and abstract thinking um, is not enough in the sense that thinking cannot help us in this personal crisis where we can just tumble and, and fall down and, and drown. And that she, uh, she experienced a person, an arm, that was taking her out and she understood that was the center or at least at one of the uh, secrets of that was what philosophy was thinking about. Which, which uh, thing or better to say, which person is the center of that what is attractive in thinking? What attracts us at all to think about world? Is the world only a sum of objects of something what is yeah, anonymous, um, existence, and, um, existence in a way of um, summing up um, a lot of things um, just, that just belong together or not belong together? Or is the center of our thinking that in the, indeed a relationship to a will, uh, mm. to a person, to, mm -hmm. uh, to, an, to a creative um, initiative? And I am able to take contact with this initiative. And this initiative is even something what, what is concerned with me, mm. and what attracts me, what, what lures me, what, what just gets me out of my, of my own small, small world. And so that is for, a, yeah, okay. Me, uh, so for, for Edith Stein then, is the, if, if, that, if those are the qualities of being itself, if being seems to have this uh, attractiveness and not only that, but seems to be almost reaching out for and to the inquirer, what does Edith Stein see as kind of an optimal stance or way of relating to being? What, what must the philosopher or the Christian or the inquirer, how, how, must, how should we relate to being, if being is this kind of reality in our lives. Yeah, yeah. Um, being is a very abstract notion. Hmm. Ontology is an abstract um, uh, field. Um, it then in, the, in her master work goes uh, through all these stages of ontology from the material uh, to plants, to animals, then to uh, humans, etc. She's doing it like in a school. It's a very good idea because we can have a common notion for many different things. 
But with this common notion, we also cover the difference between things. And uh, calling everything a being just does not take its specific and specific attractive um, idea. And so in this way, she comes to the pro problem that we only, that only humans are in, are in the situation to speak of, uh, about themselves as an I, as an ego. Plants do not speak about themselves, animals do not, but we speak about ourselves. And that means that we, are, we our, conceive ourselves as beings in a very specific way, beings that are able to reflect about themselves, to regard themselves, and to direct themselves into, a, I repeat it now, into a relationship. And the utmost possibility of our relationship is that we, not plants, not animals, can take a community with everything what is around us. We are the center of this created world. We can get into friendship with plants, with animals, etc. But the real, the real depth of this idea is that we do that, we are able to, to communicate because we are taken into the communication before we even know it. Hmm. I am given to myself. Somebody gave me to myself. Somebody um, had an image of myself and gave me to me. And in this way, the last and uh, um, yeah, vivid and, and life-giving uh, center of my, th of my thinking, of my philosophy, would be an I, not only a being, would be an ego or an I that speaks about itself in a way as I do about me. Uh, he cannot be smaller than me. He cannot be a thing when I am somebody who is reflecting. He also must be a reflecting um, ego. And she finds this, um, yeah, this um, great, great um, position in Exodus 3.14, when God speaks about himself, I am who I am. And she makes a whole uh, whole little work about that uh, problem because she says that here we are at the center, at the center of all that what we can say about reality. There's, to say I am is more than ontology. I am, of course, is, is using ontological notions, but I am means a kind of, of life of uh, reflected life, not only, but of any of a fullness of life, also of a radiant life, of a communicating life, what we do not know in other things. And so when we participate in this I am who I am, we ourselves get, um, yeah, leave our relatively small, small world, and we can get into a communication uh, not only with with him who is a giver of this of this life, but we come in communication with all other things just through him. It is not only a direct communication what I have. I have an indir indirect communication with all things through him who created it, who created uh, and who reflected this world. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have a double way of of communicating with things, regarding them in its uh, in themselves or regarding them by their creator. And the second option is something what goes beyond philosophy. The first one is, is really ontology, but the second one is, is really reaching into the into a theologi a theological inspiration and to take part in the yeah in the potences, in the forces that this um, that God gave by himself into, into this ontological world. This world, this, this ontology is more than it is in, in itself because it has this, yeah, a, a stone cannot reflect himself and a tree mm -hmm. doesn't reflect himself. But God, who is the creator of them, gives them in a way, in a way, um, a kind of, yeah, a kind of, yeah, this, it's not easy to, to express, a kind of aura, mm -hmm. a kind of being wanted, a kind of being loved. <laughs> mm -hmm. A kind of being created that gives more than just the shape of being here. Okay. No, that's beautiful. And and this this notion of um, that I've been that I've been given the gift of myself, and that I can reflect on the the gift of myself, and that I can find that giftedness from this transcendence around me and relate to everything else <laughs> as also a gift is just a beautiful yeah. way. 
conceiving of of, mm -hmm. of reality. I wonder if if to start to wrap things up a little bit, we might think about: Is there anything um, you know on the theme of this journal of with one accord? Is there anything particularly feminine? about the way that Edith Stein thinks about the divine, about being? Is there, is there anything uh, particularly of what Pope Francis called that feminine genius uh, that, that mm -hmm. Edith Stein mm -hmm. typically mm -hmm. elucidates? I think so, yes. I think so, really, because um, Edith Stein, in the very beginning of her work, her femininity was essential for her. She was working in a political party that does not exist any longer. She was working in a um, yeah in the right for women for the rights of women. Okay, um, that was a phase of her life what she took very seriously. Uh, rather than she, she did not get interested uh, very long time in the in the political question, but when she became Christian, she discovered the she discovered two things. She discovered. First of all, that man and woman are really also a gift, a gift, a gift to themselves, a gift to each other, and that the polarity of this both um, is just some, really something divine, really something divine. She goes back to the Genesis. She had a uh, few interpretations uh, at that at that problem, but the second discovery was that uh, in the realm of Christ. The, the sexes, both sexes, are in a way confirmed, of course, and in another way, just also in a kind of polarity, the meaning of sexes was a bit reduced. To belong to him, to belong to, to Jesus Christ, meant for her, she wrote about that, that the importance of being a woman or a man um, lowers a bit. Why? Because um, in a historical sense, uh, around Jesus was a circle of men and women, mm -hmm. and they had different duties. Um, up to now, the church is uh, organizing also different duties, exactly in this in this image. But she said that the love of Jesus to the, to those people who followed him was an equal love, an equal love. The imperatives were different what uh, men had to do and what women had to do. But he loved them and he loved them with an, in, a, in such a way. And she then uh, used also to speak about the rule of St. Benedict, that um, one can change even the, the rule or the, the behavior of a sex when one comes deeper and more, um, yeah, more loving in, in contact with Jesus. Because then, for instance, in the rule of St. Benedict, it is said that the, ab the abbess has to be like a mother to his monks. Mm. And vice versa, she studied, uh, by instance, of course, Teresa of Avila as her, order, as her mother. And she said that there was a male spirit in her. In the, in the radius of Christ, the meaning of sex is as a divided and also polarity, as a divided polarity lost a bit its meaning because um, Jesus as the, as the complete human being also connected both sides in him. In him. Mm -hmm. We spoke about that. Mm -hmm. And who comes close to him um, adopts also this, this type of being in, its, in himself, in herself, a kind of, yeah, close and intense humanity that cannot be divided so easily in feminine or not feminine. At this point, I think we can wrap up this conversation and I thank you, Professor uh, Gerald Falkowitz. Uh, thank you for joining us today and for introducing us to Edith Stein's own feminine genius. So thank you so much. Speed.